All right, hey folks, um, hopefully you're in the right room for the Gradle CI versus the ModuleZilla. Um, so there's a lot of blog posts out there, I've seen a few anyway, on Bazel and Buck and how to integrate them and how wonderful they are. Um, and I'm not discounting them. Um, what we want to talk about though is a little bit of a different approach. So we took Gradle and Fastlane and started combating our build problems, um, mainly our ModuleZilla problems. So who are we? I'm Spider-Man. <laughs> That's Tom. Um, no, so I'm, I'm not Spider-Man, though. But, uh, I've been working at Capital One for roughly five years now, um, and I started working on Android back when it was an Eclipse plugin. Um, so the slides that Jared had and all of that fun stuff, that's my origin story, so. Uh, Eclipse, good times, man. And I'm Dom, I helped Tom make his Spider-Man dreams a reality. Originally, I focused on app launch and login, uh, but recently joined the dark side to focus on sustainable app delivery. So what are we here for? We're here to share our custom solution and usage of open source tools, to share our experiences supporting an enterprise application at scale, what we've done and the considerations we've had to account for when building our system, and of course, to provide you, our viewers, for ideas for how you can support and scale your own app, things you might want to consider when building and enhancing your own systems. And this is what we're not here for. Um, we're not here to tell you how to implement this thing. We are gonna tell you how we implemented it, but I think there were a few talks earlier yesterday that really went into the it depends situation, so I don't wanna rehash that too much, but um, we're also not here to tell you the right way to do it. There are a lot of different use cases. There are a lot of different tools um, and blog posts about Bazel. So. Um, making bold predictions about the future of something. Um, we just don't know what tools will exist in five years, and we don't know if your app will exist in five years. So there really isn't too much gravitas behind the declarations of something of the future. Um, and hopefully we won't put you to sleep. Hopefully. So what is our problem? It's that. Look at all those build gradles and the gradle monster thing. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time on that. <laughs> <laughs> so five plus years ago, Capital One started their native Android journey with a single team. That team was responsible for building features, frameworks, the CI pipeline, releasing the app on a monthly cadence, and supporting everything that's existing in production. Since then, the number of teams contributing code to our application has grown to well over 20. Our module count has grown to well over 100. The full clean build time, including all unit tests, is over three hours, and release cadence has accelerated in non-trivial ways. Did I say we have 100 plus modules that needed to play nice? So our Batman style utility belt includes Fastlane. This is our scripting tool. We'll go into that in more details there a little bit later. Jenkins, our continuous integration server. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And GitHub, a tool that I pray needs no introduction. We're fortunate to have an enterprise instance here at Capital One. So what else can we fit into Dom's utility belt? Um, so we've got two things, two of which should be pretty common to the Android developer. Uh, you've got Android Studio, and then you've got Gradle. Um, and for those of you that aren't too familiar with that build system, uh, Gradle's an open source build tool. Um, it's pretty fast, it's flexible, so there's a really nice way to extend on the classes that Gradle has introduced. Um, it's written using Groovy, um, and you can even write it using some of the KTS or Kotlin scripting. Um, so. What is a module? Um, so, I, you know, the Oxford Dictionary, this is a mouthful. The Oxford Dictionary defines a module as any of the number of distinct but interrelated units from which a program may be built up or into which a complex activity may be analyzed. That's a module. So Gradle's build system <laughs> operates on the definition of modules or units. Um, these units will culminate into your build artifacts or something that you can execute. Um, so what we are doing, or the typical Android project structure, um, will consist of the utilization of Gradle plugins to define a module type. This is usually, hey, I want to apply, I'm an Android library, or a Java library, or an Android application. A settings file to list the resolved modules. This is the settings.gradle file. You'll tend to list whatever modules in there you want to resolve as source. Um, and then a framework and feature functionality split into separate non-application modules. If you're building an SDK, I think there was actually just a talk on this, but if you're building an SDK, you've got, you know, your SDK logic should live and be dispersed within all of your library modules. 
And then if you're building a feature, you can do sort of the same thing that would be consumed by an application module. Um, the use of the Gradle dependency configurations to build relationships. And this is sort of where you're gonna use the dependency configuration types like API, um, compile only, implementation. Um, and those all will affect how, you know, that if you're consuming it through Maven, that will affect your POM file and whether or not these can be dependencies that are leaked into dependencies that consume you or things that consume you so they could be provided um, or they could be hidden away. Um, and then at least one application module. So if you're building an SDK, this would typically be like a test harness. Um, for an actual application, this would be your application module. Um, and then an application module with regionally based flavors. Um, so if you're building an application module, you can kind of think of this as I've got a prod backend, so I've got a prod flavor. A QA backend, so I've got a QA flavor. And if you're making service calls, those service calls will go to those different backends. So if I build, if I open up build variants in Android Studio and say, hey, I want to build a prod debug or release, those calls will go to your prod debug or prod backend or debug. Then we enter with defaults.json and modules.json. So we built on top of the success that Gradle had with um, reuses of previous executions and their caching system to speed up build times. Um, we introduced modules.json. Um, this really, modules.json is a larger construct, so we use the, the term modules.json and modules.json interchangeably, but modules.json really requires two additional files, and that's what we see here. So defaults.json and modules.json. Defaults.json is a JSON file that will list out aspects that will be inherited by the modules listed within modules.json, unless override, or otherwise overridden. Modules.json, so the primary reason that we went down the path of this modules.json um, scripting and complementary scripting on top of Gradle was to solve a few things. Um, so cloning modules that live in distributed GitHub repos. You know, for an er enterprise application, there are teams that could operate inside of their own GitHub organization. We wanna make sure that we can reach into their GitHub org, clone it into the workspace, and make sure that we can resolve that as source, build it, and then ensure compat. Um, we wanna ensure compat. Um, then switching between binary and source dependencies. This is a way in which we can speed up our build times. So if we've got, if we know that changes exist within a certain module, we wanna resolve that as source so that we can build the changes that were introduced. If we know that changes weren't introduced in another module, we want to resolve that as a binary. Our build times will go down then. Module artifact creation is another one of these. So uh, with Gradle, you've got Gradle caching, and that can be distributed if you're using some type of like an, a bucket where you kind of stick all this stuff. You can reuse that bucket during a PR build and kind of pull from it so that you can skip tasks that already have cached executions. This is somewhat similar. So if we've compiled an application or a module and we know that everything was, was good to go, we're going to tag it, we're going to upload that to Artifactory, which is our internal artifact repository, which is in a sense a distributed, a way to distribute these artifacts. And, that, and then at another execution, we will pull that artifact back down. We won't have to compile or rerun all of the tasks that were part of that module. And we can speed up execution times. We can skip unit tests that don't really need to be run. Mono repos is really a, another hot button topic for you know, enterprise development or development uh, within your projects. So what is a mono repo? You can kind of view it as a repo that contains a whole bunch of these modules. Uh, we wanna support mono repos. We wanna support repos that really only contain one module. Um, it's all about flexibility in building and being able to support uh, the way that teams operate and operate differently. Um, it also makes it really easy for Lint baselining, Android X migrations, where you could have a repo that resembles one module, or you could have you know, a, a repo that has 10 modules inside of it. If I have to lint baseline 10 repos because each one of those repos has a singular module, that's 10 PRs, versus if it's a mono repo, that's one PR for these 10 modules. What does it look like? This is font size nine, so I hope you can all see it. It looks pretty good. Um, Defaults.json, again, will list the things that modules inherit. These are the things that, unless over, overridden, they will all just as, you know, we'll assume as truth. At the top there, we've got a group, and this is, we create Maven artifacts, so they use that Maven GAV, which is group artifact version. 
um, the group will specify the group ID. So here it's default group to use when creating artifacts. Um, and then we've got an exclude block. Inside of this exclude block, and, and folks should be somewhat familiar with this if you're not using modules JSON, which I'm sure a lot of people aren't. In the build.gradle file, you would say, hey, I want to depend on something, this binary version. So implementation, artifact, or gav, and then you would say, I want to exclude some dependency of my dependency. Um, this is very akin to that. It's applied at a global scope. Uh, we have a GitHub block, and inside of this GitHub block, there are three other specs, so server, organization, and branch. This all defines how we want to clone and bring that module into the workspace. And it doesn't need to be just a module. Again, we support monorepos, so it could be a repo and all of the modules inside of it. Um, so for example, uh, if we've got feature team A and they're building all of their features within their own org, that organization would be overridden unless the organization or the server matches what is inside of defaults.json. Compilation. Um, compilation allows for the specification of composite. So you can define whether or not a module is compositely built. In Gradle, you would typically use composite compilation for plugins. Um, that is to say, I want my build as a whole needs to depend on this, this other thing over here being built first. So build this first, and then this build will consume that resulting artifact. That's what composite compilation is used for. We don't use this very often, but we do have a few internal Gradle plugins that do. Um, it's been very helpful. Then resolution strategy. So you can actually enforce a resolution strategy um, of what, is, what I would like to call as a single source of truth. We have modules.json and defaults.json that live at the root of the project. Modules.json will list out the versions of those modules that everyone is to consume. We want to enforce that, let's say for instance, a module that was consuming, let's say module B was consuming module A, and module C also consumes module A. Well, module B wasn't recompiled. The version of module A that module B was consuming was 1.1, but module C was consuming module A as 1.1.5. We want to make sure that the transitive upgrading of dependencies is not performed, so we force a resolution strategy of what is inside of modules JSON. So it doesn't matter what the module, so module B or C, were compiled against in their POM file lists. We want to enforce that what we see in modules JSON is the truth, so that ensures compatibility. And then finally is our automation block. This is really where we start to get into what does, what does the CI, what, is the, what does the PR builder do during um, PR execution? We have three things here, and they're gone. They're all gone. <laughs> okay. Um, we have an integration branch. Uh, this is a regex. These two are regex. So we have an integration branch and a release branch. At Capital One, um, for the Ease Enterprise, the in enterprise application, we follow Gitflow. Um, Gitflow is, I'm not going to go into Gitflow. But uh, so we have an integration branch and we have a release branch. Um, our integration branch is really where our day-to-day, -day, our daily feature development will go into, and our release branch is aptly named because it's where we're going to ship our application from. Um, these are really important when we create the tags that will go and really become the um, semantic major minor patch for the artifact that's created and uploaded into Artifactory. So if we see that your change, your PR, is against an integration branch, you get an inter in integration tag, which would be major, major, minor, patch, and then with a suffix of some numerical value. Usually the numerical value is a representation of the number of commits that have been made into that integration branch. And then at the bottom, uh, we have depth. And this is shallow cloning, for those of you that are familiar. Um, with a repo that's as long-lived and with as many teams, 20-plus teams, contributing to it, um, we want to make sure that we don't pull back all the refs and all the commits and all the history, because we don't really need it all. So to be friendly to our GitHub uh, enterprise folks that have to maintain it and deal with the, the amount of volume and cloning that we do on a daily basis, we can specify a date. So we typically will, this is today's date. We would never do this. Um, <laughs> we will usually go a back, back a month, um, at least, because what developers should be doing with GitFlow is making sure that their feature branches are synced up with develop as often as they can or as often as possible. Um, so we would say, you know, today's 8.15, so that would be 0.7.15. Um, and we'll, we, sadly, this is a manual process, but we will inch this forward as we release um, the artifacts or as we release and cut branches. 
All right, modules.json, what does that look like? Um, so modules.json, like I said, it, it has the ability to override attributes that live within defaults.json. Um, at the top here, we have a module that's defined. It's not overriding anything. Um, it does supply a version. So if we were to look at this artifact, this module in an artifactory or a nexus, um, it would have a group ID that was specified by defaults.json. It will have a um, artifact name, an artifact ID of module-a and a version of 0.1.0. Beneath that, there's module B. It does override the group ID. It has its own version. And then we look at what is the mono repo, mono repo light, bucketed repo, whatever you want to call it. So the name at the top is no longer the artifact ID for what you would find inside of Artifactory. It's the repo name. And then we have a GitHub block where it can specify or override where we want to clone that repo and its resources or its internals from. Um, the organization is custom org, and the branch that we're going to point to once we're done cloning is any branch. Um, and then we have two nested modules. Uh, they will be resolved as source, as they have no version specified. So we have module C and module B. And then finally, getting back, wrapping this all back into Gradle, what does this look like inside of your dependencies stop Gradle block? Or sorry, your dependencies block inside of a build.gradle. Um, modules JSON does have a Gradle plugin, so you would apply that plugin, and then you would essentially use the DSL that's offered by the plugin. Say modules.json dot include library, and then you'd reference a module that is listed within modules.json. So module D in this case. We're about to merge into the fast lane. Thanks, Sam Jackson. So Fastlane is an open source cross-platform scripting tool that easily integrates with Jenkins, GitHub, Jira, Slack, you name it. It has an extensive plugin library that enables many of these integrations. Now it is written in Ruby and some of you might be, yay Ruby, and others are probably like, eh, Ruby. It's not too bad. Uh, they've, made a, they've taken a lot of different edge cases into consideration. There's some hangovers they have from the early days of the tool that you have to deal with, but otherwise it's pretty nice to work with. So Fastlane allows us to easily create lanes, that's what they call them, for various development and release processes. One of our primary uses include our PR builder. This tool enables us to check pull requests match a specified criteria. This augments GitHub code owners and protected branches. Set up the CI workspace for build against a specific branch. This is where modules JSON and Fastlane really were designed and play well together. Modules JSON switches binary modules to source and then determines which modules are dependent on these changes. Then Fastlane pulls them all together after verifying mergeability. After we set up the workspace, we run a full suite of checks and tests. This includes check style, lint, detect, unit tests, roboelectric tests, suite of espresso tests. And if all checks out there, we double check that our base branch hasn't changed. If it has changed, I mean the entire repo could have changed for all we know, we need to restart tests. This gets frustrating, I appreciate it. But uh, you know, we wanna make sure that we're running a con consistent set of repeatable tests. Then, if everything checks out, we're gonna automatically merge the PRs, close the branches, and trigger a few more retests in order to get the automation running on other pull branches. What about multi-merge? Multi-merge. Multi-merge. So our original process only allowed for singular feature branch, for a singular feature branch to merge before having to retest due to the base branch changing. This limited our system to one lane road, a non-fast lane, if you will. Uh, one, of our current, one of our recent major changes to our system includes what we call multi-merge. Multi-merge permits us to accumulate, test, and merge multiple feature branches across modules through a single automation run. This has greatly increased our overall PR throughput when compared to our original system of single serial merges. This is kind of what it felt like explaining that, so I wanted to throw this in here. It really does feel like a Charlie moment, right? <laughs> I, I do apologize. <laughs> So um, modules.json uh, and Fastlane, how do these two tools, seemingly independent, fit together? A match made in heaven. So look at this graph. Um, <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ooh. Might help a little bit. This is like a 20-foot view. This, of course, is 20-foot view and all happy path. We were originally going to include the unhappy path, uh, but it's just a bunch of decision tree, triangles, some goofy lines. You didn't want to see that. It was, it was messy. But breaking down this, this into each step, we have our pull, our pull request automation is triggered. So somebody opens a pull request, pushes a commit to that pull request, 
or, autom or manually triggers it via commenting retest. This is when automation starts, we expect our environment on Jenkins to be completely clean outside of some great old caching. During, during this step, Fastlane setting up the environment, pulling down, setting up the workspace and the environment, installing necessary Ruby gems for Fastlane to operate, et cetera. Then we clone the root project. This root pro project, of course, con contains all of the framework and scaffolding that we need to build our app. You know, what, what do we need? And then finally, we're, not finally, but next we're going to uh, validate what PRs are good to go and are capable of being merged. So what PRs have our special ship it label on? What have no conflicts? Which ones are approved? And at that point, we have a list of PRs that we can operate our automation against. Now we want to determine what the list of modules we, we should resolve as source are. So this is where we configure our CI workspace and ensure that we're only resolving absolutely everything that we have to. Um, that is to say, we want to make sure that we restrict how much we resolve. Uh, we will, from that point forward, analyze the dependency graph of what we resolved in the workspace to see if we should resolve anything else. This ensures backwards compat. This prevents future issues where, you know, I could have an interface that removed a signature that you were referencing and then suddenly your app blows up at runtime. So then, as we said earlier, we're going to execute all of our tests. Of course, check style, detect, lint, JUnit, RoboElectric. Uh, right now, a small suite of critical tests are kind of our critical path tests, but we're in discussions right now to expand that. And if everything all checks out, base branch hasn't changed, then we're going to merge all the pull requests. Let it be, you know, the single feature branch on a single module or the, you know, five plus multi-module, multi-merge. And then delete those branches because we don't need them anymore. Uh, we want to tag the modules afterwards. So this would really go back to what I was mentioning about the automation block inside of defaults.json and modules.json. We want to know what tag we want to create. So if the PR was into an integration branch, integration tag, release, release tag, um, once tagged, we will create the necessary javadoc jars, the source jars, ARs, the Rs, and then we'll upload them to Artifactory. We will push out an update to modules.json to point to those new versions. We'll push that into the root project. And this is where the developer will sync with develop, get the new versions, and then be happy. Hopefully. <laughs> but the system is far from perfect. I mean, what system is? Some gaps in the system we'd like to fill. One, effective test parallelization. First thing, updating old tests so that we can actually run them in a parallel mode. Also, right now, our espresso tests run in a single emulator on that node. We'd like to shard them across different emulators, at least on the node, potentially using something as much as a, a device farm. We'd like to provide better use, user feedback to the engineer. So right now, on the pull request, you see a status update that says, unit test failed. No other details. Uh, that doesn't help me much, so they got to go into the console and, you know, okay, scroll down. Okay, there's my problem. Got to fix that. So we'd like to provide better feedback to engineers opening PR. So you know, what actually failed? What is the problem that I need to fix right now? We'd also like to provide better documentation and training. We're growing by leaps and bounds both in teams and engineers. We're seeing a lot of very common questions that could probably be answered in better onboarding. That's on us, uh, but we'd like to improve that in the future. We'd like to provide targeted test execution. So if I change this small little piece of the app that only touches, you know, itself, why should I have to test the entire application? We should be able to test just the pieces that that change affects. Long build times, of course, parallelization and target execution should resolve this. We'd like to improve our st test ability. Uh, we have a number of very old tests in a project that's over five years old that are leaking memory all over the place. We would love to resolve that. We would like our integration branch to be always shippable. So hopefully this will also contribute to re re reducing our release cycle and making it um, less of a less of a race to get in all the code you need by code log. And finally, we would like to provide dog food builds through hopefully the Play Store um, and possibly forcing engineers to have it, but we don't know if we're allowed to do that yet, um, through a nightly build that's released through, through the Play Store as said. Okay, so um, this is kind of what you're here for, I think. Uh, what does this mean for you as fine engineers and influencers and whatnot? Um, <laughs> suggestions. Uh, these do not, they are not unique, I think, to us or the build system that we created internally um, or to any other build system. So these are suggestions that really should be taken sort of as you start your journey and hopefully not as something where you're like, oh crap, we need to consider these now. Um, 
because that can be really detrimental and, and hard to recover from. So modularity and reuse. Um, and this is modularity in the true sense of modules, right? Mo great old modules. Make sure that you've got your features, your frameworks, your SDKs divided up in a way that makes sense to you. The granularity is also up to you. You want to overdo it and have one class in one module or have an entire 50 million packages in one module. Again, it's about measuring and making sure that you understand that that can have an impact, which I think leads us to build metrics. Um, there was a presentation yesterday on the CPU profiler, GPU profiler, and understanding you know, what a problem is, measuring, defining a goal, and then uh, iterating. So that's sort of the same premise here. Make sure that you have build metrics that you can really baseline against and say, hey, we're going backwards. There's something wrong with our linting is taking too long. Um, determine and enforce standards. This will go back to code style. Um, this will go back to uh, how you want developers to open PRs, PR templates, that kind of thing. The standards are really nice and great to enforce if they're all done through automation. Making automation the bad guy here is ideal. You don't want to go in and sort of say, hey, subjectively, I think you need a space here. Cross-platform cross -platform alignment, and this may be somewhat pseudo-unique to an enterprise. Um, ensuring that when you talk to your iOS or web or your counterpart that you're saying apples and apples and not like yelling oranges and rocks at each other. Um, so whatever you're saying, hey, we're having issues with our dependency graph analysis, that means the same thing to them. Build efficiencies. Um, this goes back to only resolving what we need to in the workspace um, given the changes that were introduced. So ensuring that we only resolve as source the modules that are absolutely necessary. We'll speed up build times. We won't have to run as much lint tasks. We won't have to run as much unit test tasks, static code analysis, all of it. Technical limitations and, and requirements. This is sort of a duh. You know, how, how much CPU does your, does your cloud machine have to run with? Um, how much memory? How much RAM? Um, is it able to handle 20 plus teams? Is it able to run 3,000 RoboElectric tests at once without running out of memory? Test coverage. This is always a really difficult one. Um, I've heard some folks say, you know, coverage, um, coverage hides things. Coverage isn't really what it's cracked up to be. Just make sure that if you want to define coverage, you define it well and you define it early. Um, going into a code base that has below the coverage that you want to enforce, it's really hard to convince product owners to just then go back and say, you know what, my feature team isn't going to deliver anything this sprint because we're all going to work on tests. Um, evaluate contribution models. We follow GitFlow, you could follow fork pull. There will be adjustments to the scripting if we do have to uh, update for that. So if you're looking at tools like a Bazel or a Buck, understand what the contribution model that they support is or they would like to promote. Ensure reliable bookkeeping. Um, the tags are really important. If you've you know, got a bug in production, you want to track down what that commit was that introduced it, usually you can do so by looking at some of the commit tags, the PRs that were merged and then getting a snapshot of that code base and then building off of that and then testing. Um, this could be through lightweight you know, tags. You could use annotated tags. Um, those, those would uh, really include an author, some type of like, commit message, which is more informative than a lightweight tag. Um, organizational considerations. Uh, we're not all in the same place. We're not all building in the same org. We don't all follow the same standards. Hopefully we will. but. Um, Organizational considerations is really about supporting a federated delivery model. Um, if team A is over in org A and we're over in org B, we want to make sure that our single source of truth can still handle these differences. Training, education, and onboarding. Um, onboarding and documentation, I should say. Um, you don't want to leave the developers out to, to dry, as Dom said. Um, there are enhancements that we can make to make it more obvious that, hey, I'm seeing a unit test failure, or I'm seeing um, lint uh, failures. Maybe we could do inline commenting versus going into console output that can be quite aggressive and verbose and hoping that they just kind of understand it. Uh, controls, um, protected branches, code owners, um, making sure that you've got a group of folks that are working as your, your approvers, your mergers, um, all of that really factor into the purpose of CI. If you can naked push into a repo, then what is your CI there for? Um, and then consider the human aspect. Um, not, not everyone's going to look at this and understand it, even with the documentation. You need to allocate time to support. You need to allocate time to cover the edge cases. 
Um, I think it's been very eye-opening in this entire process, the number of edge cases that we've encountered, um, just because and just during the sprint flows. Um, so allocating the time for your fellow developers is quintessential. I think with that being said, we'd like to thank you. Yes. For now, the battle's won, but the war is far from over. <laughs> we hope this overview of our application delivery system has been informative and thought-provoking, and hopefully it helps you make your delivery system better. Thank you, and, and if there are any questions, we'd love to take them now. But, but first, I, I have a question, Tom. What, what's that? I, I don't remember that when we were. I reviewed. don't tweet good. Um, so that's my Pokemon Go <laughs> QR code. <laughs> Questions? I think we have time. Johnny's got a question. So in your fast lane chart, you mentioned that you validate the PRs to ensure there are no merge conflicts before you actually go to merge them. But during multi-merge, how do you check to ensure that the first PR you merge doesn't then cause a merge conflict for the follow-on PRs? So one, one PR at a time, we're going to validate that they don't have conflicts before we pull them into the workspace. So no conflicts, we pull them in, and then we iterate on against that same integration branch locally in the workspace. And the cool thing about the workspace at Jenkins is if we break it, we just throw it away and start from scratch on the next run. So we're validating each time. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk to us afterwards. <laughs> Um, well, I think it was like four or three years ago, we, st we were still using repo. I don't know if folks are familiar with repo. It's, a, it's another Google tool where you can specify through XML um, what modules you have and how you want to resolve them. So it's kind of like, well, hey, we could make this more flexible if we throw it over in a JSON and then we could just write JSON output to this file. And then it turned into an automation tool from that. So it really meant to be a replacement for repo not an automation tool. And then it started taking these baby steps towards like, hey, we could use this for a PR builder. And it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and more edge cases led to more scenarios that we had to cover. It was an evolution. Revolution, depending on how, the def definition you're using. <laughs> Other questions? Um, so it depends. We, we run a suite of uh, UI automated tests, and they're not the fastest. So if you want to look at it from a perspective of the holistic picture, um, the build time itself, given the dependency graph analysis and all that fun stuff, we have a fixed number of UI automated tests that run at the end. It's about an hour and a half. But if we resolve everything as source, without even the UI automated tests, it's three hours. But depending on what you're changing, there's a potential for it to be down, the, down as low as six minutes. It all depends on how you're using the tool, you know, how, what's being used as binary versus source. So it can be a lot shorter. It's all about what you're integrating. Yeah, how, how complex the graph is. So we don't just deliver one application with modules JSON. There's a few, there's some test harnesses in there. And what's really nice is if I've got a module and I'm just building out like a component, and I don't want it to be delivered to customers or to production yet, I just have it integrated into that test harness application, we cut out a whole bunch of this picture. And so what Tom is referring to is we have had PRs that are opened that will merge within six minutes. So our fastest one, I think, was clocked at like 6, 12, 6. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Any other cool. questions? Very good. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. <laughs>